One day, in the country of Sumer, part of the ancient land of Mesopotamia, students were hard at work at homes all across the famous city-state of Nippur. Their teacher had asked them to write a journal about their lives and their country. Nisaba, one of those students, chose to tell how writing developed in her homeland. My grandfather says that in the old days, nobody knew how to write. Writing started when my ancestors needed a way to keep records on what had happened from year to year. Like how much grain each farmer had grown. And how much different people got as their shares. And how many sheep and cattle they had. How many animals died and how many were born. And how much of everything was given to the gods. We started out by drawing little pictures that represented words. Like this picture, it represented a star. Well, over time, people started writing faster. And the picture of the star changed to this. And eventually this. Now our writing looks more like symbols than pictures. We combine the symbols to make words and names. See, here's how you write Udu's name. Udu is my pet sheep, by the way. Our style of writing is called cuneiform. That means wedge-shaped. All the symbols are made up of little wedge marks. That's because we use a tool called a stylus to write. We cut them from reeds that grow along the river. We'll never run out of those. We write on clay tablets. There's plenty of clay around, too. All we have to do is pat some clay into a pancake, then cut a stylus, press the end of the stylus into the wet clay, and start writing. When we're finished, we put the tablet in the sun to dry and harden. Then the tablets last forever. Well, almost. Writing helped make our civilization powerful. Because we could keep records, we could make plans for the future. That's what my dad does. He works for the king. His job is to tell the farmers which fields to plant and which crops to grow and how much. So we're always sure that we'll have enough food for all of our people. And enough for the gods, too. Like my mom always says, I'm a very lucky young woman. That's because I'm learning how to write. I go to tablet school, which is called an aduba, to train to be a scribe. It takes 12 years to learn. Not many kids get to learn how to write, especially girls. Mostly, there are boys in my class. We learn our cuneiform characters by writing down proverbs and riddles that the teacher gives us. Scribes, we call them dubsar, keep records of just about everything important that happens in Sumer. Like how much tax everyone paid. When the traders leave and what they take with them. What the gods tell us to do and on what day and what offerings we make to them. We've also written down our laws. I was surprised to learn we're the first civilization ever to do that. When they're written down, laws can stay the same for longer, and they take on a life of their own in a way. Some scribes work with the priests in the temples. The priests watch the moon and stars every night, and the scribes write down everything they observe. The priests are looking for signs that will help them figure out what the gods have in mind and also for hints that a flood might be coming so we can make sure our levees are strong enough to hold back the water. Our priests have gotten very good at figuring out how much time has gone by. So scribes also write down when things happen. That way the priests can look for patterns in the past and try to predict the future. Our civilization couldn't function without scribes. There are too many details for anyone to remember them all. But as long as we can write them down, we don't have to worry about forgetting. Some other things we don't want to forget are our stories and legends. We're the first civilization ever to write our stories down instead of just retelling them to each other.
A lot of our best stories are about the gods. Those stories are called myths. Here in my city-state of Nippur, the patron god is called Enlil. He's the most important god in Sumer. Each city-state has a special god that protects it. Even though we believe the gods made us humans so we could take care of them, there's a story that tells about the time when the gods had second thoughts about having created human beings. They decided to send a huge flood to wash everybody away. But one of the gods didn't agree. He told a man named Ziu Sudra put his family and all the animals he could find into a boat. It rained and stormed for seven days. But Ziu Sudra was safe in his boat. And that's how humans and animals survived the Great Flood. There's another really famous story. It's one of my favorites. It's a very long story called an epic. It's about a king named Gilgamesh. He's a hero who has a lot of adventures, along with his best friend, whose name is Enkidu. Enkidu is a wild man who runs with the animals but then he meets Gilgamesh, and they really hit it off. One day, they were looking for adventure, so they decided to travel west to the mountains, high up into the cedar forest, to bring cedar wood back to the city. Cedar trees are tall and straight, and the wood lasts a long time. It's perfect for building a palace. But there was another reason for going to the cedar forest. A demon lived there. He was a huge, angry demon named Huwawa. Gilgamesh and Enkidu thought they were strong enough to defeat him in battle, and they wanted to try. So the two friends set out. They moved so fast, a trip that should have taken six months, they made in just two weeks. Leaving the river valley, they climbed higher and higher. The air became crisp and cool, and they could hear the sounds of rushing streams and the wind blowing in the trees. Soon they reached the place where the cedar trees grew tallest and straightest. They brought out their axes to start cutting them down. Gilgamesh had just touched the first tree with his axe when they heard an awful roar. It was Huwawa! The demon took a giant leap toward them. Why are you cutting my trees, he said. Leave now or you'll be sorry. His face was horrible and twisted with anger. Well, I would have left right then. But Gilgamesh and Enkidu turned to face the demon. They called on the sun god to protect them. The sun god liked Gilgamesh, so he sent the 13 great winds to wrap themselves around Huwawa and bring him to the ground. The demon promised Gilgamesh all the cedar wood he could carry if only he would set him free. But Enkidu didn't believe a word. Don't let him go, he warned Gilgamesh. So with one swift stroke, Gilgamesh killed the demon. Then they were free to choose the finest cedar trees. They cut them into logs, lashed the logs together into a raft, and floated back down the Euphrates River to the city. After that, Gilgamesh was even more famous. Tales of his deeds even reached the ears of the gods. The goddess Inanna heard about Gilgamesh. She was the goddess of love, and she fell in love with him. But Gilgamesh brushed her off and was very rude. Well, Inanna was also the goddess of war, and now she was furious. She sent the giant bull of heaven to trample the city. As the bull charged toward them, Enkidu caught it by the horns, and Gilgamesh struck the beast with his sword and killed it. The grateful people threw a huge feast to celebrate, but the gods were not pleased. Soon afterward, Enkidu became very sick and died. Gilgamesh was really upset. He started to search for ways to become immortal, so he'd never have to die himself. He decided to find Zia Sudra the only man to survive the Great Flood. Surely he knew the secret of eternal life. Gilgamesh wandered into the wild lands and eventually came to a door leading into a mountain. It was the entrance to the land of the gods, 
guarded by fearsome scorpion men who allowed him to enter the dark tunnel where no human had ever set foot. At the end of the tunnel, he found the dazzling Garden of the Gods, where the bushes were hung with jewels. There, he found a woman who asked Gilgamesh why he looked so sad. I want to be immortal, Gilgamesh said. Just enjoy your life, the woman replied. Eat, drink, dance, love, that's what life is for. But Gilgamesh wasn't convinced. So the woman told him how to cross the ocean and find Ziosudra. But when Gilgamesh finally found him, Ziosudra couldn't help. Immortality is a gift of the gods, he said. It is their secret and theirs alone. So Gilgamesh came home empty-handed, but wiser. Now, as he looks at the walls of his city, the city he spent his whole life building, he realizes how much better it is to do good work in the time that he has, rather than spend time trying to become immortal. So that is part of the epic of Gilgamesh. His story and my journal are alike in a way. When our stories and thoughts are written down, other people can read and understand them. And that's why I think it's so great that we've learned to write. Because now, our stories and ideas can be remembered forever.